Uh, I'm Dr. J.T. Kostman. I am a data scientist, a mathematician, and a psychologist, and I'm happy to be joining you today. Thank you so much, Dr. J.T. Quick question for you. So what was your initial interest in data science? Kind of what, what led you into that field? Well, I was in data science for long before it was a field. I actually learned to code on an IBM 1620 with Hullworth punch cards back in the 1970s. And so I've been in and around this industry uh, long before anyone even thought about any of this stuff. And, and I think data science has been around much longer than that. I think the first data scientist was actually um, fictionalized by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It was Sherlock Holmes. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So uh, I did, I read an article that you posted, I think, at end of January of this year called the economic dangers of AI, much ado about nothing. Can you just share some of the key takeaways kind of uh, for, for your thoughts on are jobs really going away or are, we, are people safe for now? Yeah, you know, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, it's an area I've given quite a bit of thought to. You know, when people talk about the economic impacts of AI, we tend to talk about it uh, sort of uh, uh, as if it's, unitary, as if it's uh, one aspect of the economy that it will be impacting, but really the smarter, the more sophisticated way to think about it is the impact that AI will have at the micro, the macro, and at the meso level, right? And when we think about it at the macro, at the micro level, that's usually where most people are thinking about it. They're thinking about with jobs, rightly so, because that's what's going to impact us, you and I, day to day. Uh, and most of those concerns tend to be very misplaced. There was a, a study put out by Oxford University, you're probably familiar with, that projected that something like 47% of all jobs in the U.S. will be gone in, I think it's 15 years. Uh, let me tell you, that's nonsense. It's not going to happen. We will see reattribution of aspects of jobs. We'll see people taking on different dimensions of jobs they do, but it's not like half the jobs in America are just going to go away. Uh, it's in some ways very similar to what we've already seen. You know, uh, I'm old enough to remember when we used to have elevator operators in New York and someone would push the buttons for you. And yeah, that job went away, but you know, it's okay. It's not like many of those people go to an island somewhere. And in fact, when my father was a young man, the most populous job in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, and most seaport cities in the United States was a job called stevedore. Have you even, do you know what a stevedore is? No, Nobody no. does. Uh, but it used to be the most populous job in, in most cities in the U.S. Really? Uh, and those are the people who pick things up and take them on and off of ships. Ah. And we replace those with container ships and forklifts. Mm -hmm. But we have forklift operators and crane operators and people who work with the shipping industry. And there are still people who do this sort of work. Is it going to take retraining, re retooling? Sure. By all estimations, we'll lose about 1.8 million jobs. But according to Gartner, we'll probably gain about 2.3 million for a net improvement of about half a million jobs. And those are going to be better jobs. Right. And so we need to start preparing for some of that. Will everyone make the transition and the journey? Unfortunately, no, but most people will. You know, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to also remember when the term secretary wasn't a pejorative term. We used to have secretaries in corporations. Now we have EAs, and thank heaven, because we can't live without them. Yeah. But that's at the micro level, right? At the macro level, similarly, we worry about, you know, whoever really takes on, uh, well, Vladimir Putin says, whoever... Uh, leads the way in AI will be the ruler of the world. And I don't know if he's talking militarily or economically, but he is right. Uh, and that's an area we should be concerned about. We're seeing China move far beyond the U.S. in the, cap the investments, uh, uh, the push toward evolving some of these capabilities. Those are things we should be worried about, very rightly so. And I've been writing and speaking quite a bit about that recently. But then also at the meso level. That's the level that actually concerns me the most. And those are all the mid-strata companies. Uh, you know, a guy named Daniel Corton wrote a book about 30 years ago now, 25 years ago, titled When Corporations Rule the World. And when I read it, I thought it was this dystopian lunacy and nonsense. But it turns out he was right. It was very prescient. 
And it turns out we now have like the fang companies, right? Facebook, Apple, Amazon, now Alibaba, Netflix, Google, these companies that are not only eating so much of the market, but they're making competition near impossible for people who don't have those capabilities. And I don't know if you've seen it, but there were two articles recently, one in the New York Times in October, another in Bloomberg in May, uh, something like that. And uh, I'll, I'll send you the citations. But they talked about these incredible wages that are being paid to people in AI. And they made the point that there are uh, only about 10,000 people who are truly qualified to do this work in the world. Yeah. And these fine companies are eating up that talent, which is making everyone else is that much less able to compete. Yeah, yeah, that's I did see something like that where they are, they have about 10,000 people. And this is definitely the skill set that that's going to be needed in the future. But what you're saying is jobs are not going away, they're just shifting and morphing into something else. And people should be on the lookout for that. They they are. And, and I've written uh, a couple of posts and articles recently about what I think we're going to see as a uh, a response to that is the resurrection of sort of a guild mentality, right? Are we going to see that you no longer have to have a PhD or even a master's degree, or maybe not even a college degree to start to enter this field? Could we see a time in the very near future where we have a return to the apprentice journeyman master level uh, in data science, where, where you can become a data technician uh, as an entree point into the field and then be able to accelerate uh, what contributions you're able to make. Yeah, that's definitely a point of controversy that I've been reading a lot about where parents are now saying, I'll be proud of my kids if they don't go to college. So it's kind of a... Cause it's so yeah, you know, I mean, one has to wonder with, um, the, you know, the, the incredible rise in tuitions lately, uh, uh, the sort of recalibration of what's really important, the distinction between value and values that uh, the current generation, I think, is more rightly trying to realign themselves around. And most importantly, the recognition that this is the first generation we've ever seen in the US uh, where it's unlikely they will do better than their parents' generation. Mm. And so uh, I think they're coming very smartly to redefine what does better mean? You know, does it always have to be about the paycheck? Um, can it be a, more about a sustainable, holistic life uh, that, that gives you true value instead of just valuing it by, you know, how many zeros are on that uh, uh, tax form at the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, personally for me, it, it's also shifted in terms of better. I'm no longer after money. I'm after flexibility and kind of working remotely and being able to just enjoy life and not just work all the time. You know, I used to teach in the MBA program, and one of the points I used to make to my students was we, we tend to forget that money is a myth. Uh, money is not a means. It's not what we're after. Money is merely an expedient. It's a mechanism of getting what it is we want. And so if you could just get what you want, why do you need the money in the middle? You know, I, I'm not saying money is unimportant. Uh, I have money and I like it. Uh, <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I've been rich and I've been poor. Rich is better. Uh, if you can make money, if you can have money, that's terrific. It makes your life a lot easier. However, you also have the risk of getting on what's being referred to in psychology as a hedonic treadmill. There comes this point where you can never have enough, where there's never enough. Mm -hmm. There's also, you know, I read an interesting article years ago that your life isn't that much different than Warren Buffett or Bill Gates. And I've actually met Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, and it's true. Um, Warren Buffett lives in a horrible little house uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. He really does. It's a horrible little house. And uh, he's happy. You know, and the one thing these guys have that you don't have is a private plane, a private jet, uh, which would be lovely. Uh, I travel quite a bit, and I love a private jet. But you know what? I, it doesn't make or break my life. Other than that, they drive a car like I do. They live in a house that they like, like I do. They have jobs that interest them and engage them, like I do. They have children and grandchildren, like I do. You know, it's, and I think we have to say to ourselves, it's not a contest, really. So get over trying to win and have the most points, which you measure in dollars. Right, right. Very good point. So um, another question I have for you, it's a bit more personal, but I guess still professional. 
what uh -oh. be <laughs> um, your biggest goal for accomplishing this year? Um, making my uh, wife, children, and grandchildren that much happier. Really, that's it. I mean, professionally, uh, I, I, I try not to set too many goals and expectations for myself. I'm a big believer in surfing rather than hiking. Uh, if if that makes any sense, right? You know, uh, I, I ride motorcycles, and uh, there's uh, that's one of my passions. And there's this old saying that young riders have a destination, old riders have a direction. You know, uh, an old rider, we get on a bike and we just kind of go, and wherever the road takes you, uh, you enjoy the experience and you enjoy what you see along the way. And that's sort of been my philosophy professionally. Uh, unfortunately, maybe, but for pretty much my entire career, you know, I have a pretty diverse yeah. background. Uh, that's why I've just, you know, made it a point of enjoying the journey and not worrying so much about the destination. Okay. And actually, yes, yeah, speaking about your diverse background, one of the questions I had was about your experience as a deep sea rescue diver. Yeah. How was that? Yeah. You know, I was uh, at the time I went into that field, uh, I was originally an EMT and then I became a paramedic. And uh, I don't know if you know the difference, but EMT to paramedic is uh, the difference of, of Boy Scout to ER physician. <laughs> it's, it's a quantum level difference of what you can do. And so I took a lot of training and I was loving being a paramedic, but uh, um, I, I didn't see that there was a long-term career goal and I was frankly getting bored with it and uh, in a bar one day I met a bunch of uh, commercial divers deep sea divers you know those are the guys with the hard hat and the umbilical that goes to the surface and you know they do underwater welding and explosives and and electronics and building it's really amazing anything you can do above water pretty much you can do below water mm -hmm. and they were telling me that uh, they just passed a new law for Canada, for the North Sea, for around Brunei, several of these areas, well, you needed a medic on the dive rigs, and they also needed to be a commercial diver. And the only people who were qualified to do that would be uh, nurses, physicians' assistants, mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and paramedics. Well, they weren't getting a lot of nurse practitioners out there. And physicians' assistants, you know, were making way too much money to do that, do that kind of work. And so they were desperately trying to recruit paramedics. And frankly, it sounded like fun. And uh, the pay was incredible and got to travel around the world. Uh, and so I went to commercial diving school and I became uh, at the Professional Diving School of New York on City Island, New York, part of a company called International Underwater Contractors. And so I went to work for uh, IUC for International Underwater Contractors. Uh, when I, which, by the way, uh, one of the board members was Jacques Cousteau, so that was pretty cool. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and so uh, uh, got to work with them, and then a couple of other companies, Global Marine Contractors, a few others, uh, traveling around and uh, working at the intersection of being uh, a diver, a working diver, but since I was also trained as a paramedic, running the hyperbaric chambers and those sorts of things, and then going and doing rescues. And so, yeah, I ended wow. up doing that work for a while. That sounds really amazing. Very yeah, it was, it was fun. Everything I've done has been fun. And the way you know that is if it wasn't, I, I would have stopped doing it and gone to the next day. I have a similar mentality, yes. I do. Yeah. I try to follow the passion and the fun. So, you know, and frankly, that's what I tell a lot of the people who do what we do now. They get stressed out about our work. Yeah. And I, they pay us big bags of money to sit around having fun and solving puzzles and problems and working with really smart and interesting people all day. This is like the greatest job in the world. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. There you go. So the last question I have for you is actually going back to the travel. If you had to pick one country to live in for a whole year, <clears throat> which country would it be out other than the U.S.? Ah, uh, see, so you say other than the U.S. Boy, I don't know. Um, I just got back from Australia and uh, loved it. Had a great time there. But uh, I did some of my postdoc in uh, 
at the University of Moscow, believe it or not. Okay. And uh, I really enjoyed being in Russia, uh, Paris, uh, and, and all of France, uh, some of my favorite places in the world. I love London, the UK. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it would have to be uh, someplace really off the map. Uh, I think it would be either someplace in the Caribbean. I enjoy uh, uh, Grand Cayman, the Caymans, mm -hmm. Caicos, those kind of places. And I like being on boats and, and being in and around those areas. But I could also see being in the Basque country, you know, in the Pyrenees. Uh, uh, Zurich is another place. Uh, and Basel uh, in Switzerland. I, it would be really hard for me to pick one place, but but I think it would have to be some place where my passions are pe good people, good food, good conversation. So any place where you have the intersection of those things and preferably good motorcycle riding, uh, I'm there. Okay, very good. You didn't really pick one, but we'll go with all of those countries. Thank you. We'll go with all of the above. Uh, you know, I've... I've enjoyed pretty much any place I've ever traveled, except for one or two locations I traveled to when I was with the U.S. Army Special Forces. But those were different circumstances. I'm sure I would enjoy them more going as a tourist. Right. I, I'm sure of that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being on Humans of Data Science. It's really been very interesting getting to know you. And it's been wonderful chatting with you, Kate.